Darla, that was so beautiful. Welcome everybody uh, to the temple. We're so glad that you're here. Darla's beautiful piece um, was um, played. This is a, a Epiphany Sunday and churches all over the world are celebrating Epiphany. We're going to read from Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders the Lord over mighty waters. The voice... The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord causes the oaks to whirl and strips the forest bare. In his temple all say glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Okay, now we will pass the peace and greet each other. standing as we sing our first hymn, Praise the Lord, ye heavens adore him, on page nine in your hymnal. We're going to sing verses one, two, and three.
affirmation of faith. Church, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Uh, welcome to the temple. My name's Kurt. Pastor Phil's not here today. He's driving back from Houston where he had to do a wedding last night. So you're stuck with me again this week, but he'll be back and back to normal next week. Our scripture reading for today is Mark chapter 1, verses 4 through 11. It says, John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached saying, after me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptizing by John in the Jordan and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. Will you please pray with me? God, this morning, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Bible. And God, as we, in just a few minutes, when we open it up and we learn from it, I pray that it will inform us as we're here to worship you this morning, God. Let our worship be pleasing to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. We're going to go ahead and say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
let me start uh, by saying, uh, sorry, I rushed off the stage a few minutes ago after I did the scripture. My son, Austin, as you know, uh, has some health issues and uh, has lots of seizures. And he was having a really bad episode just a minute ago. So uh, I didn't do the Lord's Prayer. I had to get back out to him and make sure that he was being taken care of. So, But he's fine now. There's good people standing with him and helping him out. So... Um, we're going to be in first Kings today. And, uh, I've, I've taught this the last two services and uh, I don't know if you're aware of it, but we have an eight forty five service and then one at 10 o'clock. And, uh, uh, I taught this there. There's a lot that I'm going to go through this morning and I'm going to try to not talk fast because every time I teach people are like you talk too fast. Um, I had one lady tell me one time, she goes, I'm never coming back when you teach. I said, why? She said, you talk too fast and you use bad grammar. I'm like, people who correct your grammar don't get invited to your crawfish bowls. So uh, I'm going to try to not talk fast. And and there's not going to be any notes come up on your screen. And I don't have notes in your program uh, or in your bulletin because, quite frankly... Um, what I have won't fit in your program or in your, uh, on the screen. So what we did do is, um, I wrote a study guide that goes along with this sermon because all I'm going to do is basically give you the introduction and I have a nine and a half page study guide that are on the, I think they were in the back. You could have got them when you came in. If not, they're on the front pew right here to where I'm done. You can go get the study guide and study through it this week. And if you read the study guide and you look up every passage that I put in it for you, you'll read a total of 320 verses in the Bible this week. But it will help give you context to what we're talking about this this morning. And part of my goal is, uh, I've told the last two services, part of my goal is that when you leave here today, uh, I don't want you to be scared. I don't want you to be freaked out. uh, But I want you to realize that there is a world out there that may be bigger and more involved than what we ever thought. A lot of times we, we grow up in church and we hear Bible stories that are very uh, vanilla. They're very plain, but, but there's so much more to the Bible. It goes deeper and wider than you can possibly imagine. And it deals a lot with spiritual warfare. And what we're going to do is we're going to go back to the Old Testament in the book of 1 Kings. And uh, the ultimate goal today was to start talking about the prophet Elijah. I can tell you already we're not going to get anywhere near Elijah because there's just too much, too much good stuff. And the, well, Elijah's great stuff. But what I want to do is I want to set the, 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 the picture for you that when you leave here, you understand how big and mighty God is. And you understand how real the spiritual warfare is that we are engaged in. So, so with that being said, um, there's, we're going to just like, I told the other two services, I, I said, put on your waders because we're going to start in the shallow end and then we're going to go all the way into the deep end and, uh, and, and learn more about the word of God. So I have a few uh, things just to set the foundation for which we're going to build on. Okay. Uh, first thing is I want you to remember, uh, and I've talked about this before, but by way of reminder, we have always been and always will be in a spiritual battle. Until Jesus comes back to his second coming to set up his final kingdom, we always have been and we always will be in a spiritual battle. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12, it says, For we battle, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against the uh, against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. Again, this, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. The Apostle Paul's telling us very plain in Ephesians that our battle is not against people. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but our battle is against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. Those are demonic spirits. And I know that a lot of times we, it's easy for us to believe in God. It's easy for us to believe in the Holy Spirit and we believe in angels. But just on the other side of that kingdom of light, there's a kingdom of darkness. And there's a, there's a devil who's real. There's demons who are real. Here they're called spirits, spirits of evil in heavenly places. There is a spiritual battle going on between uh, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. And, and Paul reminds us of that. So by way of reminder, I wanted to remind you of that as well. And here's the thing. 
as Christ followers and as Christians, we don't battle against the people. We don't battle against the people who disagree with us. Our battle is not against the opposing political party, whichever party that might be for you. Our battle is not against the people who do evil. And I believe the church of God, we, the body of Christ, we lose our focus. And I believe the devil likes it when we do it. We, lo- we, 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 we lose our focus. We stop focusing on the battle that's at hand and we make the battle about the people. So we get angry at people. We get mad at people. And we battle people because we don't agree with their behavior or their stances or their, or, or their ideology. But God's telling us here, <coughs> our battle's not against the people. It's against the spirits that influence the people. Does that make sense? Jesus modeled this for us. And I put one in your study guide in Mark. I give you one example where Jesus comes across this man who's possessed with a demon. You see, when Jesus started his ministry on earth, everywhere he went, he ran into these evil spirits. He ran into demon possessed people everywhere. And what you'll see the pattern in Jesus's ministry is he battled the spirit that was in the people and he cast them out. One, he even cast all these demons out into a herd of pigs, but he cast demons out and he shows mercy on the people. So our battle is not against the people, it's against the spirits of the dark world. And God uses us, sons and daughters of the Most High King, carriers of the light, to bring light into the darkness, to identify what our battle is. And what we're going to do is we're going to go look at ancient Israel and realize that it's different days, but we have the same demons. It's different days, but it's the, some of the same battles we're facing and, and so the Bible says that we have weapons to fight this battle with. In 2 Corinthians 10, 4, it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. They're not carnal. But they have divine power to destroy strongholds. So a couple of things we're learning right off the jump is we're in a spiritual battle. Spirit of God against the enemies of wickedness. The spirits of darkness. And secondly, is God's given us uh, weapons. To do that, there's spiritual battle. God's equipped us with weapons to fight in these spiritual battles. And what does it look like if we reorient our Christian life and we stop thinking about what God can do for me and we start praying about how God can use us for him? A lot of times we go to God with our, we wake up in the morning and we, we give God his to-do list for the day and we call it prayer. But in reality, God's like, hey, we have a spiritual warfare and I've invited you to be in this kingdom and to expand this kingdom of light. The Bible says in Ephesians 1, 3, this is not in your study guide because I added it like four o'clock yesterday morning. And I think it should be our memory verse. I told the other two services, make this your memory verse. I'm not trying to give you Jesus homework. I'm just trying to help be a a tour guide into the Bible so you can be, uh, the Bible can become illuminated in your life and and, and some things can open up into this world that God's called us to be a part of. Okay. Uh, Ephesians 1, 3, the Bible says, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly realms. Ephesians, what is it? Yeah, 1, 3. Blessed be the God and the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed you with all spiritual blessings in heavenly realms. When I, when I looked up that verse yesterday morning and I wrote it down, here's a question that God asked me. He said, okay, do you realize that I've already blessed you with all spiritual blessings? I've already given it to you, Kurt. I was like, yes, I realize that. And then the second thought that I had was, well, then why do I keep asking God to give me things that he's already blessed me with? Why is so much of my prayer life oriented around me asking God to give me things when he's like, uh, I already blessed you with those things. So the, the issue isn't that God hasn't blessed us with what it takes to live in the kingdom of God and to expand the kingdom of God. God's already identified the battle. He's already created weapons. And according to Ephesians, he's already given us all spiritual blessings to battle in the heavenly realms. The issue is we don't possess our possessions. We get distracted from it. And so the, the next thing I, I want to kind of put on your radar is a, a common metaphor This is all in your study guide, so don't feel like you need to take notes. A common metaphor in the Bible, the Bible used to talk about the spiritual battle, is a metaphor between light and darkness. And in your study guide, I put uh, 16 different scriptures that you can look up where it paints the pictures of light versus darkness. It said, the Bible says stuff like, uh, Jesus is the light of the world and in him there is no darkness at all. It says, we are to live in the light as Jesus is the light. The Bible says stuff like, for those who love the Lord, they walk in the light. But those who walk in darkness have no love for the Lord. You see this compare and contrast between the light and the dark. Light is good and the darkness is evil. And what God wants to do is God wants his people. He wants us to live in the light. 
and Satan wants his people to live in darkness. So this spiritual battle that we're, we're seeing unfold in our world and we see unfold in ancient Israel is this battle between light and darkness. But what the devil has done, and we're going to look at it from the Bible as he did it in Israel, and what he's doing today is see the spirits of, of the enemy, they don't come in and just turn off all the lights at once. It'd be too obvious, but the people of the earth would react to that. But what he does, what the devil does, is it's like a dimmer switch. He slowly just starts dimming the lights. Generation after generation, the world gets darker and darker and darker and darker. You see, what, what, what secularism would like us to believe is that progressivism really works. Progressivism says, you be you. Live your best life now. Let everyone individually find out who their God is and what life is, and things will naturally get better. The question, when's the last time you looked around the world and thought, yeah, things are naturally getting better? Ain't happening. So what the devil does is he slowly turns down the dimmer switch. And then every now and then throughout the course of history and biblical history, Every now and then God sends his men and women of God like the prophet Elijah or Jesus himself and they show up and they're like, hey, hold up. It seems like everything's getting darker and I'm here to turn a light on. In fact, the Bible talks about at the end of the, New, at the, end of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament, when um, God was telling the people, he's like, hey, you're not listening to what I'm saying. Your world is getting darker and darker and darker. And then all of a sudden, God's like, hey, you knuckleheads, you're not paying attention to me. I'm not talking just to hear myself speak. I'm just going to uh, stop talking. And God did for about 450 years. God didn't spoke. Today, it's referred to as the dark ages, where things were so dark on this planet with Israel, God just didn't speak. And that's where we end the Old Testament. And then 450 years later, you open up and now we have the New Testament. It starts with the gospel according to Matthew. And the first thing we read about in Matthew was, hey, there's this lady named Mary. She's a teenager and she gets pregnant uh, by the Holy Spirit with the Savior of the world. And Jesus comes. And what does Jesus say about himself? He said, I am the light of the world. Light came. So uh, God, uh, this battle is, is going on. And, and, and so as we look at things in Scripture and we look at the Bible, I don't want us just to look to the Bible. I want us to look through the Bible. I may get to it and explain what that means in a little bit. If not, it's in your notes. Um, and then the, the last thing I want to, just by way of building the foundation, is uh, there are false gods and pagan gods mentioned in the Bible. And those gods are real and they were real. When you read scripture and it talks about do, have no other gods before me, which we're going to read that passage in a minute. God's not saying the, the false gods of the Bible. They're not cartoon characters. They're not make believe. They're actual, real, disembodied entities, spiritual entities that existed then and they exist now. And they're at war against the spirit of God. The spiritual battle is real. The unseen world, God has his seen world, us, and God has his unseen world. The devil and demonic spirits are part of this unseen world that Satan uses <coughs> to battle against God. Not here to scare you, not here to be weird, but I will say this. A lot of times we like to skip over the weird parts of the Bible. I was having lunch with a pastor, a uh, uh, I don't know, back in November, and uh, not from our church, a different church. And we were at an all-you-can-eat sushi place, which you lo I, they, they lose money when I walk into an all-you-can-eat sushi place. And uh, we were sitting at the table, and he, he said, so what are you teaching at your church on Wednesday nights? I said, I'm teaching through the book of Daniel. And he goes, oh, really? And this dude's smart. He's got two PhDs, one in Old Testament theology, one in New Testament theology. And he said, uh, he said oh, wow, I guess you're stopping after chapter six, aren't you? I said, no, we're just going to keep going. And he goes, I would stop after chapter six because it gets really weird in chapter seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12. And, and that, that, that resembles our modern day American church to where if things get weird in the Bible or we don't understand it, we just say, it's too weird for me. I actually heard a pastor the other day make this statement. He said, hey, there are things in the Bible that you're just not meant to understand. That's a lie from hell. In fact, over and over and over and over again in scripture, God tells his people, I tell you this so you may have all wisdom and understanding. But so many times we have a lazy approach to the Bible. And we like reading the same stories over and over and over again. And we want to memorize the characters and the main stories that make it on the flannel graph in our kids' Sunday school class. But we don't do the deep dive into the things of God. Therefore, we don't have an understanding of the nature of God. 
And the Bible says, I want you to have wisdom and understanding about these things. So these pagan gods, they were real demonic forces that existed then and they still exist today. And I'll prove it to you with the Bible. And if I don't get to it, it's in my study guide that I wrote for you from the Bible. Okay. So let's stay, set the stage of context. We're going to look back a little bit historically in the Bible and talk about some kings that reigned over Israel. Israel, God's chosen people. You know, you had King David. We all know that. King David was a pretty good king. Messed up a little bit, but ultimately he gets like a C plus or a B minus. King David was a good king. In fact, God said he's a man after his own heart. Uh, after King David was king, his son Solomon became king. And Solomon, uh, the Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 11, let's watch how the light starts getting dimmer. Let's watch what caused it. And let's l- watch the reaction to God with it. That's what we're doing, okay? 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord had said of the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they be with you, for surely they will turn your heart after their gods, lowercase g. So here's what that verse is saying. Solomon's king of Israel. God told Solomon, hey, do not marry Hittite women, Amorite women, Moabite women, Edomite women, Sidonian women, don't marry them. God has things he doesn't want us to do. And by the way, it's important to God who you marry. And God said, do not marry these women. Why? He said, for surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. God said, don't marry these women because they will make you start worshiping these false gods. Solomon, who was a pretty good king at the beginning, made a decision to ignore God and do what he thought was best. Solomon didn't think he was making a bad decision when he married all these different women. He thought it was a good political strategic move because the women that he married, the Amorites and the Moabites and the Sidonians, they were the kingdoms that surrounded the nation of Israel. And his logic was, if I marry into those families, then the kings of those nations will never invade Israel because, you know, We're all one big happy family. Solomon thought it was a good decision, although it was a decision that God said not to do. God takes it seriously when he tells us not to do something. God, there are consequences when we do what God said don't do. But sometimes we don't see it because we don't know the word of God. So God said, do not marry these women. And Solomon thought it was a good idea. That's why the Bible says in Proverbs 14, 2, another verse that's not in your study guide because I added it later. In Proverbs 14, 2, the Bible says, there is a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof is death. There's a way, seems like a good choice, seems like a good decision, but is it God's choice? And is it God's decision? There's a lot of ways we can justify disobeying God. We can say stuff like, well, times have changed. It's a different culture now. Hey, God still has his law. And God still tells us to do things. And God tells us not to do things. I want to give you this analogy. um, And and, and I think it'll make this things clear. I was having lunch with some guys Friday over at uh, Touch of Cajun, which is a, I love restaurants. I love eating. So much fun. We were going to go out to eat after church today and then go home and watch the Cowboys get beat. But with Austin having issues, I don't know if we're going to go out to eat or not. But, side note, but, um, but oh, I was talking to these guys at Touch of Cajun and, and, and I looked at one of the guys and I said, I think that you have a flawed view of who, who God is. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, I think you have a flawed view of who, of who God is. And, and he goes, well, he's just the rule guy. He like tells us what to do and what not to do. I said, I, I said no, let me give you this example. Uh, when I was in middle school and high school, I played baseball. You can tell I'm really athletic. <laughs> um, that was a joke. Uh, I played baseball and I love watching baseball. And I don't know if you you all are baseball fans, but there's some fundamentals in baseball that I think make a good comparison to God. And I told these guys, I said, you see God as an umpire in a baseball game. What's the umpire do? He's there and he calls balls and strikes. He says what's fair and what's a foul. The umpire is there to make sure the rules of the game aren't broke and to enforce the rules of the game. The umpire really isn't supposed to have an interest in who wins or loses a game. He just makes sure 
everyone plays by the rules, then he gets his check and he goes home. And if that's your view of who God is, it's a flawed view of God. You see, there's also two coaches on the diamond at a baseball game. You have your first base coach and your third base coach. And the way it works is this. If I'm playing ball and I'm in the batter's box and I, and I hit one on a rope out to left center or left field. And uh, when I hit the ball, you're taught from Little League, don't watch the ball, watch your coach. The first base coach. Because the first base coach is standing there and he sees the whole field and he sees where your ball went. He knows if the left fielder bobbled it. He knows if he caught it. He knows if it went over his head and burnt him. So the first base coach, as soon as you're out of the batter's box, you know what he'd say to me? Pick me up, which means look at me. Don't watch the ball because you can run faster and more efficiently when you're just looking at the coach and you're not following the baseball. If you played ball or coach ball, you know this. <coughs> so the first base coach, he's watching the field and he'll tell you. He'll tell us to do things. He'll say stuff like, get here. Or if the left fielder bobbled the ball or he got burnt if it went over his head, the first base coach starts waving you to second. Dig, dig, dig. So you turn first. As soon as I turn first base, guess what the third base coach does? He starts yelling, pick me up, which means look at me. Because my job running is not to see where the ball is and what's happening in the field. I pick up my third base coach. And that third base coach has a perspective of the field. And when I get to second, he'll hold, stay. Or he'll say, take two or stay at two. And that means you stay in second base. Why? Because the coach saw that the guy's going to throw it in and he didn't want me to get thrown out. Then the next guy gets up to bat and I'm watching the third base coach. This dude gets a hit. And if it's a pop up, the coach is like, wait, wait, because he's going to see if he catches it, see if I need to tag up or if he burns him, he's going to say go. Ultimately, the coach's job is to see me experience the joy of getting home. That's the coach's job to see me experience the joy of getting home. The umpire's job is to call the balls and strikes and enforce the rules. God is our coach. God asks this, put your eyes on him. God says, pick me up, watch me, watch me. There's going to be things I tell you to do and not to do just like a coach does, but it's not because I'm just this God who's a cosmic killjoy And I have this rule list that I want you to obey. It's because God says, Hey, I want to see you experience the joy of getting home. But what happens in Solomon's life, God says, Hey, eyes, look at me. Don't marry those women. And Solomon got distracted and disobeyed God. He disobeyed God because he thought he had a better plan. He's like the baseball player who the third base coach is trying to hold him at second, but he thinks he can outrun the throw from left field. And he starts running, slides into third and gets thrown out. That player then gets mad. He gets mad. Hey, stop being mad at God because bad stuff happened in your life because you did stuff that God told you not to do. Not his fault. And, and, and so this, 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 we also have an opponent, opponent on the baseball field. We have a team that's playing against us. That's Satan. You know what the devil wants? Everything about spiritual warfare. Here's what the devil wants. He wants to get you and me to take our eyes off of God. He wants to distract us. Because the, God wants to see us experience the joy of getting home. The devil wants us to experience the defeat of getting thrown out and walking back to the dugout. So Solomon, and so these guys, I'm having lunch with them, and he goes, he goes that's a good analogy. He so, so God's not just an umpire. I said, no, God's your coach. And today he's saying, pick me up. Keep your eyes on me. And we're going to see in the nation of Israel how over and over and over again, um, they, they took their eyes off of God like Solomon did. And he married these women. I put in your study guide, I'm not going to go into it. I did it the first service. I kind of did at the second. I said I wouldn't go into it the second service, and then I kind of did it anyway. And here, I'm not going to, but I'm going to kind of do it anyway. But get into it on your own, okay, please. And uh, um, look at the women that, that Solomon married. Again, when you read the Bible, uh, don't look to it, look through it. The Bible says that he married Moabite women. What's the big deal? I, I wrote this in your study guide. The the, what's the word, the origin story of each group of women. So the Moabites, where did the Moabites come from? Just, just good for you to know. Go back to Genesis 19. And there's a story of a guy named Abraham and he had a nephew. His name was Lot. Remember that story? Lot went and lived in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, wicked, evil cities, sexual immorality. They were having, um, perversion with everyone, anyone of all ages. 
Children, it was horrific what was happening in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Absolute sexual immorality and perversion. And Lot, Abraham's nephew, moved there with his wife and his two daughters. Well, you know what? One day some angels, this is in the Bible. I put this reference in your study guide so you can read this story. One day some angels go and they knock on Lot's door. God sent angels to Lot's house, part of the unseen world. Although these were embodied angels. And Lot opens the door and these angels say, hey, the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah is a stench in the nostrils of God. That's what it says. God's going to destroy these cities. He says, so you and your wife and your two daughters need to leave because God's going to destroy it with fire. And Lot asked the angels, he's like, well, do you want to come in? Are you hungry? Do you want to eat? And the angel said, yeah, we'll eat. I don't know what angels eat. Maybe angel food cake. Surely not deviled eggs. <laughs> these angels came in and ate. In fact, this city is so wicked that while these angels who were men were in Lot's house, there's another knock at Lot's door and he opens it up and there's some young men from the town and they're like, hey, send out those two guys who just came so that we can be with them. Yes, that means everything you think it means. And Lot's like, ah, these are angels of God. Don't do that. They're like, no, send those men out. You know how wicked Lot had become? Lot goes, I'll send my two young daughters out to you. You can have your way with them. To a mob of men outside his house. Well, anyway, Lot and his wife and his two daughters, God says, flee from Sodom. And he gave him a command. Does anyone know what he said? Don't look back. Don't look back. If you look back, you're going to die. So they start running. Lot, his wife, and his two daughters start running. Lot's wife does something that God said not to do. She looked back and she died immediately. The Bible says she got turned into a pillar of salt. I guess you could say she was assaulted. I got jokes. So Lot and his daughters, they're scared. This is all in Genesis 19. They're scared and they go and hide in the caves of Zor. Lot's daughters, some time had passed, Lot's daughters are hanging out and they're like, hey, we have no man to get us pregnant. I got a plan. His daughters got Lot drunk. And then the Bible says the oldest daughter went in and slept with her dad and got pregnant by her dad. And then the younger daughter went in, slept with her dad, and got pregnant by Lot. Lot, Abraham's nephew, has now impregnated both his daughters. The older daughter gave birth to a son. She named him Moab. He created the Moabites. His younger daughter, had, who was pregnant, gave birth to a son. She named him Ben Ammon, who created the Ammonites. The origin story of the Moabites and the Ammonites come from an evil man whose evil daughter seduced him, got pregnant by him, got him drunk, and then started nations. And God said, don't marry the Moabites. Don't marry the Ammonites. The Edomites came, you know, Jacob and Esau. The Edomites are descendants of Esau because Esau went over and married one of Ishmael's daughters. Ishmael's a guy who started Islam, started uh, Hamas. Uh, Ishmael had 12 sons and they all have Arab names because that's where the Arab nation came from. That's where Afghanistan came from, from Ishmael, who was a byproduct of Abraham sleeping with his maidservant. See, Jacob had 12 sons, which became the 12 tribes of Israel. Ishmael had 12 sons. The counterfeit, what God creates, Satan imitates. And so Esau went over and married in with, with, the, with Islam. And out of that came the Edomites, their descendants of Esau. Uh, the Sidonians, I said I wasn't going to do it, and here I am doing it. The Sidonians, God said, don't marry the Sidonians. Where'd they come from? Remember Noah, the guy who built the ark? He built the ark, got off the ark. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Well, Noah, the Bible says, became a man of the soil. He planted a vineyard. He got some grapes, and then he fermented the grapes, and grapes that are fermented make wine. And the Bible says that Noah got drunk, and he was laying in his tent naked. And his son Ham came in and saw his dad, Noah, this great man of God, drunk and naked. And Ham made fun of him. Ham um, uh, dishonored Noah by making fun of him for being drunk and naked in the tent. But uh, Shem and Japheth, Noah's other two sons, heard about it. So they took up a blanket, walked backwards into the tent to not look upon Noah's nakedness, the Bible says, and covered him. I mean, who wants to see their dad naked anyway? But 
They covered him. When Noah woke up and heard how Ham had made fun of him, you know what Noah did? Noah and God cursed Ham's son. Ham had a son whose name was, anybody know? Bible Trivia 101. Ham's son's name is Canaan. The Canaanites, a cursed people. The people that God told Israel to drive out of the land. The Canaanites came from Noah's son, Ham, and they were cursed. Canaan had a son named Heth, which means to dread or to instill dread. Heth created the cursed son of Ham, Canaan, had a son, Heth. Heth, whose name means to dread, he founded the Hittites. So you look at all the, the, the categories of women and the nations that God told Israel and Solomon not to marry into. And you could just read that passage and you go, Hittites, Amorites, Moabites. But when, you, when, when we stop being lazy, when we approach the Bible, and I don't mean that to offend. I'm not. And I told the other two services, I'm not here to offend anyone. I'm here to offend everyone. No, I'm just kidding. Um, we may leave with bruises and sometimes it's okay for the Bible to bruise us. And when we look at the scripture and we read through these things, sometimes God says, hey, it's here for a reason. So dig in a little bit. So God told Solomon, he's like, don't marry these women. And Solomon took his eyes off of God and things start getting dimmer. I'm not going to make it very far in this message. And then Solomon died. And things were getting so bad after Solomon died. Guess what happened? The nation of Israel split. The ten tribes in the north became Israel, and the two tribes in the south became Judah. The northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. In the southern kingdom in Judah, you had Jerusalem. And then, uh, and because they started to worship the gods of the wives that Solomon had married. And God takes it seriously when we worship other gods. In Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 6, it says this. And you know this, I think. It says, and God spoke all these words saying, listen to what God said. He said, I am the Lord your God. Who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Verse 4, he says, You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is heaven above, that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. God is telling us, do not worship these demonic, pagan, false gods. He says, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. I will visit the iniquity of the fathers to the children, to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. How does God define people who hate him? It's by people who worship pagan gods. And he's like, I'm going to curse you and your kid and their kid and their kid. I'm a jealous God. Verse six, but I will show steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commands. God takes it seriously when we don't worship him. Okay, all that was just the introduction to my message. (laughs) You think I'm kidding. I'm really not, but we'll be done. I'll quit soon. I want to to hit this. So then what I was going to do, and it's in your study guide. Then what I do in your study guide is I talk you through the historical and biblical, uh, using all Bible, on the next five kings that Israel has, because you will see the light get darker and darker and darker. So, So after Solomon... Uh, the, the nation split to, to Jerusalem or to Israel and Judah. And then we, we meet in first Kings chapter 13, which Robin and I talked about last week. We meet King Jeroboam. Here's what the Bible says about Jeroboam. It says he's a king of Israel. Here's what God said about King Jeroboam. It says the Lord will strike Israel as a reed is shaken in the water and root up Israel out of its good land that he gave to their fathers and scatter them beyond the Euphrates because they have made their, they have made their ashram. They provoke the Lord to anger. And he will give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam, which he sinned and made Israel to sin. Here's what we learn about Jeroboam real quick, in a nutshell, paraphrased. Jeroboam provoked the Lord to anger. God actually told Jeroboam, you've provoked me to anger. How would you like to leave here today? Does anybody want to leave here today and have God say, hey, you have provoked me to anger? (laughs) I don't think any of us want that. What was it that made God angry that Jeroboam did? It's right here in the text. It says, um, he says, uh, because they have made their ashram. It's in your Bible. It's in your study guide. It's in your Bible. A lot of times we will read that and be like, oh, they made their ashram. And we don't know what that is. Again, be diligent when you get into the word of God. What is an ashram? Well, I did the homework for you. So here we go. Ashram is a sacred wooden post, pole, or pillar 
that stood near the altars in various Canaanite high places. High places are places where they built their temples to worship the demonic pagan gods. You'll see, even Paul went to the high places and destroyed temples. They worshiped their pagan gods in high places. When you see the phrase high places, it's not spiritual, and it's not godly, it's demonic, okay? Um, Sons of the Most High, all that reference goes back to demonology in Scripture. But anyway, the ashram was a wooden post that they built to worship the false and demonic goddess Asherah. That's what Jeroboam did. Jeroboam stood up in front of the people of Israel and said, hey, we're going to worship Asherah, this false demonic goddess. <clears throat> Listen, she was alive. that demon spirit was alive then and it's alive now. And you'll see it throughout scripture, depending on what nation worshiped her, they gave her different names. Even Greek mythology has her as Venus. That was the demonic goddess Asherah. In the New Testament, you'll see it play out more as Jezebel. In fact, Jesus addresses the spirit of Jezebel in Revelation to when he wrote the letters to the seven churches. In fact, he goes, what I hold against you is you have tolerated. The word tolerance has been thrown around in wrong ways these days. He goes, you have tolerated that spirit Jezebel, which is New Testament for Asherah. So what Jeroboam did that started to dim the lights even more is he, the Bible says right here that he caused Israel to walk in sin. He caused Israel to worship the false goddess of Asherah. What did God say in Exodus 20? You should have no other gods before me. Now Jeroboam, this cat, decides it's a good idea to start worshiping the false goddess Asherah. Who's Asherah? I'm going to finish with this and then I'll let you go. And, and you just read the notes. My class on Wednesday nights, I'm continuing this lesson for the next eight weeks on Wednesday nights. And we're going to get into uh, the prophet Elijah. We're going into King Ahab, Jezebel. And uh, it's going to be eight weeks on Wednesday nights. We are videoing them and we will put them online. So if you can't make it to the class on Wednesday night, don't quit on me now, okay? Um, let's just continue this for the next eight weeks. Uh, Asherah, a false god, demon spirit, she did exist and she still exists. She was taught to be the ex-wife of God and mother of the demon spirit, Baal. Baal is another demonic god that you see all over the Old Testament. Greek mythology, he's known as Zeus, okay? Um, the demon spirit, Baal. She was a goddess of fertility, I'm going to get a little raw here, but we're all grown-ups. If we're that little bitty baby right there, but he can't understand what I'm saying. Um, she was a goddess of immorality, sexual perversion, uh, homosexuality, and transgender. That was her. She was a goddess of that. She was a goddess of sexuality and prostitution. She called herself the queen of heaven. The earliest evidence of pornographic material dates back to worship to her. The false goddess Asherah the way they would worship her was they would engrave um, explicit images into stone and in a, 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 a parchment, and they would use that as offerings of worship to her. They wrote, and you can find these online. I wouldn't suggest it. I did it. <laughs> I think that's what my internet got. My internet got flagged at work the other day. But you can look at the sacred hymns they wrote to worship Asherah. They were hymns that describe in detail, explicit. Sexual immorality with men, women, and children. They would write these hymns, and that's how they would worship Asherah, the god of immoral, immorality. They would worship her with pornographic images and writings of sexual immorality. They would worship her by that. And Jeroboam stood up and like, hey, that's the god we're going to worship. If you go and look, the word graphos is Greek for writings, and the word porne is Greek for prostitution. And so pornographos, we get our word pornography today because of Asherah. Pornography is how they worshiped her. And now that is pumped to every person's phone in America, no matter how young or old you are, we have it at our access, which is actually uh, the very worship. Pornography is worship to a demon God. I, was just, I said it in the other two services. I don't know why I wouldn't say it here. Uh, pornography is worship to a demon God. That's why it's so dangerous. You wouldn't go home today and just play around with a Ouija board because you realize that's dangerous. But yet today in our culture, pornography and sexual immorality is just paraded. In fact, Asherah, this false goddess, you know what she decided to do? This is all fact, by the way. She decided that she wanted a holiday. Don't distort the word holiday. Holiday means holy day. Set aside, 
by purpose for God. So not everything's a holiday. So be careful what you call a holiday. It's a good day. It's a good long weekend. It's a day to remember this, remember that, or celebrate that. But a holiday has to do with how we set it apart to honor God. So, hey, Halloween's not a holiday, okay? It's just a night people go trigger, whatever. I, don't get me started on that. Um, but, uh, but, 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 King, but the goddess Asherah, she said, I want a holiday. She goes, here's when, the, when it's going to be. It's going to be the week before and the week during summer solstice. And what we do at her holiday is it would be absolute um, immorality. Think of the worst sexual perversion parties involving everything from abusive children, all genders, all together. And that's how they celebrate her holiday. And she said, we're not going to be ashamed of it. That's in the, you go back and look at the Mesopotamian calendar, Mesopotamian calendar you know when that time period was? It was the month of June. You know what we have in the month of June now? Pride month. Asherah, the false demon goddess, was the founder of Pride Month. By the way, just look at it through these lenses. Uh, in Ezekiel 28, Satan got kicked out of heaven. God says, hey, uh, I hate pride. And devil, you became prideful. I hate Pride is what caused Satan to get kicked out of heaven. And now in our nation, we have a whole month dedicated to it. Same demons, different days. I told you my prayer was that our eyes just get open to the reality of the spiritual battle that we're in. And you need to go back and listen to the 10 o'clock message and the 845 because all three of these have been different. I just hit different parts because there's no way I'm getting through all this. Asher was also known as the transformer. She would have people transform their genders. She, if you were a, one of her priests and you were male, she'd have you dressed like a female. If you were female and one of her priests, she would have you dressed like a male. She had you, she was the transformer. And, and then uh, in worship to her, guess what would happen? A byproduct of people worshiping her through sexual immorality. Um, people, women started getting pregnant with babies they didn't want. And so you know what her answer to that was? This is all true. Demon spirit with a strategy. She said, oh, you, all you ladies are getting pregnant with kids you don't want because you're doing immoral things to worship me. Now she built arenas next to her temples to where when your babies were born, you could come in and sacrifice your babies to the goddess Asherah. And I said it like this in the last two services. When a nation, okay, God takes it seriously when a nation doesn't trust him. But when a nation begins to worship sex, it is the children that ultimately get abused, wounded, and killed. Same demons, different days. Some questions to think about. What would it look like if the demon goddess Asherah was active today in America? Uh, we would see a rise in sexual, uh, immoral sexual behavior. We would see a rise in the availability, frequency, and use of explicit material. It would just be everywhere if it was same demons, different days. We'd see the effects of the transformer in people who change their most basic desire. Instead of being transformed by the renewing of their mind, they wake up and their mind says, I'm a man, but like Shania Twain, I feel like a woman, so I want to transform my body to fit my mind. It's opposite of what God says. God says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This female goddess, the transformer, if, if her active in our society today, we would see people transforming their bodies and changing their gender. We'd see a rise in children being abused or trafficked or exploited and even killed due to perverted desires. If Asherah was alive and well today, which she is, the things that were on the fringe and used to be taboo, those things never spoken of would now come into light and they would not only be accepted, but they would be celebrated. What one generation tolerates, the next generation will participate. Toleration leads to participation. And God's saying, hey, listen, folks, I've got some men and women of God who are going to stand up and speak from the word of God. And God says, do not worship any other God beside me. The, the crazy thing is, in the Old Testament, so many of Israel's kings made worship to Asherah, a state-sponsored religion. So this is what we're going to do. And that was just King Jeroboam. I've got four more kings to tell you about, but I'm out of time. You go through King Nadab and King Basha. You know what God said about King Basha? He said, hey, you've been so wicked. I'm going to kill you and all your family and the dogs are going to eat you in the city. 
God's provoked to anger. And then you get all the way to King Ahab. And you know what God says about King Ahab, which is in your study guide, and we're going to hit it in my Wednesday night classes. What God says to King Ahab, it says uh, uh, that you have made me angry. You've promoted Abel. Uh, no, sorry. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord of God to anger than all the other kings that were before him. That's what he says about Ahab. So here's what's happening is it just keeps getting darker and darker and darker. And then in first Kings chapter 16 and 17, um, guess who shows up? A man of God, the prophet of God, Elijah. He steps up. He's like, Hey, it's getting darker. I'm about ready to flip the light on. And that's what we start reading about as we get into the story of Elijah. I know I'm past time, but here's what I'm going to end on. Okay. I'm going to read this verse and then we're going to do communion. Here's what we end on. Joshua chapter 24, verses 14 and 15. And I won't comment on it. I'll just read it and then we'll stop. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites, you know who those are now, in the land that you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Question, what would it look like today for you to walk out of here and say, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord? The devil wants to distract us. Take our eyes off the coach. God's saying, pick me up, serve me. Do what I said do, and don't do what I said don't do. Let me pray, and then we'll take communion. And we're going to do communion probably a little bit differently than you normally do at the traditional service. Um, I don't do that to break rules. I just do that because um, I'm really not sure how you normally do it. So just, it'll be, it'll be biblical, I promise. It's not going to be weird, but just follow with me on it. And I'm sorry. Let us pray. God, we love you. Um, thank you for your word. Thank you for your teaching. Thank you that you are the God who was and is and is to come. And so, God, as we come before this table uh, to take communion, God, I pray that as we remember you, the death, burial, and resurrection, God, I pray that it will mean something to us and it will <clears throat> it'll speak to our hearts in new and real ways. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, before, as we get ready to take communion, um, I have people ask me all the time, they're like, what is communion? Why do we do it? And here's my best way to explain it to you, okay? Um, first of all, we do it because God told us to. He said, this do in remembrance of me. He said, this is my body, which was broken. This is the bread. And this is my blood, which has been shed of the new covenant. Um, so when people ask me, like, how, how should we approach communion? Um, here's, here's, my, here's my story. Is July 16th of 2022, I got a phone call that my 